This is really incredible. We have 18 people and it's five minutes early. It's good. You let them let them in, no? No. <laughs> now we have to start on time because then it's just messy. Okay. But usually people come on time. Anticipation. <laughs> They're excited. Anticipation is building. Yeah. Not Mary yet, but you uh, uh, texted her, right? I did. And I emailed her, so. She might be in the middle of something and jump on a little late, which is okay. Yeah. To introduce her towards the end, too. Okay. Yeah, her preferred hours are nine to two, so. Yes, which I can totally relate to. Mm-hmm, yeah. All right, two more minutes. Reverend Fahad, your your name Abu Akal. That means Abu the, Akal. But uh, Abu let's Akal. stay with Abu Akal. Yeah. Abu Ak Abu Akal. Mm -hmm. So that means the father. A A Qaf Lam. So, but there is, we just put Akal. Yalla. Okay, but that means that you're very smart, right? I, I agree with you. <laughs> It means the, the father of the brain. That's exactly true. Yes. Or it also means the hatta, the, the black that goes around the kafiya, right? So here. Yeah. So that was your, your father also. Yeah. Yeah. So the family uh, name is Abu Aqil, and my father's name is Labib. Labib. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Abu Akal is the way you pronounce it, sort of American. Uh, yeah, then uh, you know, unless you are uh, Arabic and know how to do ah, uh, it's you don't know what, what you're talking about. The Ain, yeah, Abu Akal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so shall we let people in? Sure, I'm going to mute myself now and. And as you know, we usually give a couple minutes even after we let them in, yeah. just anyone else join. What's that? What's that? Susan, you and Reverend Fahad have to unmute yourselves because I muted everybody. Okay. Welcome everyone. We're just waiting for uh, a few more people to trickle in. Welcome to our gathering voices uh, this Tuesday. 
and we're absolutely delighted to have with us uh, Reverend Fahad Abu Akal, uh, who, as you know, is a Presbyterian minister and will be joining shortly. So if you could take this moment um, to put your name and uh, where you're from in the chat. Welcome again. We'll get started in just a moment. So we'll get started. My name is Susan Smith, and I'm Director of Operations and Community Engagement with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And normally, Ariel Gold, our Executive Director, would host a Gathering Voices, but Ariel is uh, under the weather. She's here um, listening and managing the tech behind the scenes, but she's not um, uh, moderating or hosting the conversation today. So please, as you join, um, if you can put your name and, and where you're joining us from in the chat and uh, also mute yourselves. Um, the format for the program today is um, we have about 40, 45 minutes to uh, speak with Reverend Fahad Abu Akal, who is our guest today. And um, then we're gonna have a 15 minutes or so for questions and answers um, from all of you. So welcome again. And at this point, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to all of you, for those of you who do not uh, know him already, um, Reverend Fahad Abu Akal. And uh, Reverend Fahad is a core member of the FOR team. Um, he uh, joined us in January at the Emergency Summit for Gaza in uh, Chicago. He was with us um, a few weeks ago for the Holy Week pilgrimage for Gaza in Philadelphia, which ended up uh, with an action at Lockheed Martin, at which 25 people were arrested, including uh, Ariel Gold. And um, he will also be uh, part of FOR's conference confronting gun violence and uh, white Christian nationalism, which we'll be having in Atlanta in October. So uh, with that, um, Reverend Fahad, welcome, welcome so much. It's wonderful to have you with us today. I want to say it's a, a great honor uh, to be uh, the guest for Fellowship of Reconciliation, this gathering. And I want to say special thanks to Ariel and to Susan for uh, inviting me to Chicago and also to Philadelphia. I think I'm already a member of Fellowship for Reconciliation. Yes, absolutely. And and actually, you're a, a core member of our Atlanta chapter. So we have just an hour, which is actually now 50, 55 minutes ahead of us. And uh, we were joking before we started the call. Um, Reverend Fahad was born in 1944, which makes him uh, just about 80 years old. So we've got... Um, a lot to cover in a, in a short amount of time. And what is one of the many things that's remarkable about Reverend Fahed is um, he was born in Palestine, British mandate Palestine, but Palestine in 1944, prior to the creation of the state of Israel. And he was uh, born into a Christian family in the town of Kufr, uh, the village of Kufr Yasif, Yasif in the Galilee. And um, as most of you know, uh, Galilee is a place where the prophet Jesus walked on water and he fed thousands of people and many miracles took place in that holy land. So Reverend Fahed, if you could tell us what, what was it, how was it to grow up in that very special place at that very special time? 
I grew up uh, 25 miles northwest of Nazareth in the Galilee area. It's called uh, Lower Galilee. So basically, I am uh, close to the Mediterranean Sea or to the famous uh, town called Acre or Acre or uh, Telemais in the time of the New Testament. And uh, I grew up in a Palestinian uh, Christian family, belonged to the Orthodox Church. My parents belonged to the Orthodox Church. And the church that my parents took me uh, to worship in, uh, the stone building, is about 800 years old. And I think it's the third building. That means maybe the first one was 800 after Jesus. Uh, the second building was a thousand after Jesus. And the, the building that I went to worship in is 800 years uh, old. And uh, uh, since you already uh, confessed my age, I was thinking, you know, people will think I'm 65 or, you know, 69. But this last Saturday, I celebrated uh, age zero. And I think I see some of the people here are eight zero, and I think uh, it's uh, I feel full of life and it's still kicking. The only thing I remember, Susan, about uh, the Nakba, you know, the word Nakba uh, means in Arabic means uh, catastrophe. That means you lost a home, you lost a land, you lost uh, uh, a church, you lost a mosque. You lost a business, you lost everything. So when I share my story, the word Nakba becomes clear. Uh, the only thing I remember about uh, the Nakba as a four-year-old kid is going with my father, five sisters, and two brothers. And as a four-year-old kid, the your heart and passion is really after mother. Uh, so I can see myself every time I see the children of Gaza. I see myself running around dad, five sisters, and two brothers looking for my mother. She was not there. And suddenly I look, and she was standing on the top of the roof. For Americans to stay standing on the top of the roof, it doesn't make sense. But in the Middle East, it makes sense. It's flat. Uh, she uh, waved, and I can see her like in a television screen. And we did not go north toward Lebanon. We went east to the mountain to a Druze village called Yirka. And we were put in a makeshift uh, uh, tents. It's like scouts. We were there for several months and then came back. My mother was alive. And she lived to be 86. My dad lived to be 96. Uh, basically, as a teenager, I always wanted to ask my mother, why you did not go with us? And I discovered she was uh, strong. She was the treasurer, the decision maker. My dad was a farmer. So she did everything. She was the key person is in reciting the scripture and so forth. And I discovered, she said to dad, you take the children. You can protect them. I'm going to stay here. This is our home, uh, our land, and our church. They want to kill me. They need to kill me uh, as a Palestinian Christian in my home. And uh, so when we came back, five Palestinian villages were destroyed to the ground uh, as we go to the month of May, uh, that will be the establishment of the new state of Israel. That means the moment you think about five Palestinian villages, Susan, immediately say that in 48, 49, uh, the new state of Israel destroyed, according Alan Pappy, an Israeli Jewish historian in the Haifa University, destroyed 530 villages and towns and exiled by four hordes between 750 to a million Palestinian out. So that's uh, that's uh, basically uh, my memory of the Nakba. 
Yes, and um, that information is also well documented by um, Walid Khaldi from uh, Harvard University and, and the, his books, All That Remains, um, and Before the Diaspora. So, uh, Reverend Fahd, if you could share a bit about what it was like um, to leave your mom and then come back some time later. So, and and how did it change? You left Palestine, but then you came back, and it was Israel. Yeah, I mean, uh, I stayed basically. Yirka is still in Palestine. It's only like maybe uh, six uh, miles away in the mountains. Uh, so, uh, as a child, you don't have the biggest idea what's going on. The only thing you think about dad, mother, and brothers and sisters and so forth. But uh, as I grew up, I discovered that even though the 155,000 uh, Palestinians, Muslim and Christian, that stayed in the state of Israel, uh, became Israeli citizens, but in the mind of the Israeli decision makers, basically we were occupied. That means they created 65 new laws to control our lives, from movement to education, uh, to labor, uh, uh, to everything in, in our lives. So imagine from 1948, to 1966, when I came to the United States uh, to pursue my education, I was not able to leave my village, Kufr Yasif, to go to Akka or Nahariya or Haifa or anywhere without going to the Israeli military governor in Arabic, Al Hakim Al Askari. And there, you need to request why you going where you are going, and they give you a, like a piece of paper, a permit. So if I'm found without a permit anywhere outside my village, I go to court, and uh, if I don't have the money to pay the fee, they, they will send me to jail. So basically, uh, I will say from day one, the Israeli appetite system began controlling the lives of Palestinians who are citizens of uh, Israel. So from 1948 to 1967, everything they learned about controlling our lives, the Israeli clutches left and start focusing on Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. So you left to uh, immigrate to the United States in 1966, which was a year before the Naqsa. Um, which was another catastrophe with the, the mass exodus of uh, Palestinians from the West Bank. Uh, East I, I did not. Uh, yeah, I did. I did not immigrate. I came uh, to go to college. You came to college. OK. Correct. And uh, tell us about that. What, yeah. what informed I, your transition? I, uh, uh, ba basically, I was accepted in the summer of 65. Uh, but I couldn't uh, come. Uh, so I arrived to the United States of America, January the 29th, 1966. I arrived uh, to uh, New York, from New York on Eastern Airline. I went to uh, Tampa, Florida, and the airport was very small, and nobody came to meet me. It was a Saturday. So uh, basically, this taxi driver looked at me and said, can I help you? I said, yes. Where do you want to go? I said, Lakeland, Florida. He said, I'd love to take you. So I came to the conclusion, a taxi driver in Tampa, Tel Aviv, Cairo is a taxi driver. They know uh, the stranger. Uh, because my mind was still in Galilee. You don't go from village to village or town to town alone. Uh, we go, we fill the car, everyone pay $2, $3, and we fill and we go. So my mind was still in Galilee. So God forgive him, uh, took $45, and uh, the the regular was 12 cents, and the premium was uh, 29 cents. 
So that was your welcome to the United States. So, I mean, 19 cents. And uh, and the stamps was uh, three cents. So this is not during Abraham Lincoln. We're just talking about uh, 1966. Which is and, a lot uh, of money, yeah. So you, 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 you were born and raised a Christian, uh, Orthodox tradition, correct. but you came to the United States and somehow you became a Presbyterian minister. And yeah, not only- I, and, and I need to tell you the, what, uh, what, why. Uh, number one, uh, I want to say the key spiritual nurturer will be my mother. And uh, she helped us to memorize the scripture in Arabic and so forth. The second one was two Scottish Presbyterian missionaries, Dr. Doris Wilson and Ruth Lennox. Uh, Doris Wilson was a medical uh, doctor, uh, medical missionary. And uh, uh, so she is really the key person as I watch her life. She was the first woman medical doctor in my village and basically both Christian and Muslim women want to go to a woman uh, doctor and not to a man. So when she came, she will have, you know, 35, 50, 65 uh, patients every day. She uh, uh, was uh, a person of faith, but she lived her faith. Her life was very important as I examined her life. Uh, so uh, first, my mother. Second, the Dr. Doris Wilson, and uh, by the way, a Presbyterian landed in Beirut, Lebanon in 1823. Uh, and then uh, they went to Syria, then later Iraq, Iran. And then we, of course, they went to Egypt and they grew the fastest in Egypt. So the largest Protestant denomination in the Middle East is Presbyterian with a million uh, followers uh, who are Presbyterians in Egypt. And anytime you say the American University of Beirut, the American University of Cairo, it was really built by Presbyterian prayer, missionaries, and dollars from the United States. But I made a decision to become a Presbyterian at Columbia Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. Why the transformation from uh, your Orthodox faith? Number one, I would say uh, in the in the Galilee area, the church had a cultural shock after the Nakba. A lot of people uh, uh, became refugees, and the people who, who stayed like in my village, uh, the young uh, people. Uh, you know, after high school, they start working. And um, basically in Israel, unless you work on Sunday, they kick you out of the job. So I remember as a teenager going to the Orthodox church, you had eight older women inside and eight men outside smoking. And, uh, you know, there's nothing that captivates you as a as a teenager and so forth. So the... the uh, the medical doctor mayors make sense on my mother of my faith. And the third part, I never forget, I was in the ninth grade. And this uh, teacher, who is a, a graduate of the Hebrew University under uh, Martin Buber, who is a, a, a key Jewish philosopher and a professor at the Hebrew University, he came and said, I do, not, I do not want to teach you the class. Why? I want to tell you the story, the, the story of Martin Luther King. And he just told us, you know, what happened to the black people in the U.S. and what Martin Luther King is doing and why he is in prison. I would say that Martin Luther King made sense out of my faith. 10,000 miles away, more than the Orthodox priest in my village then. And uh, uh, so uh, I felt the call to the ministry. I couldn't go to Egypt to study. I couldn't go to Lebanon to study. And two women from Memphis, Tennessee, opened the door for me uh, to come to Southeastern University down in Lakeland, Florida. 
And then when I came to Columbia Seminary, I felt uh, uh, my theology and the Presbyterian theology, uh, it's, uh, I, I love the Presbyterian theology and uh, the seminary. And, uh, and the whole idea is that, you know, as a minister, I am a teaching elder and the person who is an elder, that fellow is a ruling elder. We are all one in Christ. So there is that democratic system that captivates you to your faith. Yes, you were telling me earlier that um, the word Presbyterian comes from the Greek equality. Yeah, and in Greek it's presbytero. And that's, yeah, and that's uh, basically the founder of the Presbyterian church is John Knox. You remember Martin Luther in Germany, then uh, brother John Calvin, and uh, uh, basically Knox was a student of Calvin. And in few years, he made the whole island of Scotland. So the mother church for the Presbyterians uh, is the, the, the church of Scotland. Yes. So so you've lived, Reverend Fahed, with great adaptability from one culture shock to another, to being born in the idyllic uh, Palestine uh, village of uh, Kufr Yasif to being ex expelled by the, the Nakba and leaving your mom and then coming back and then finding yourself a second class citizen and then um, leaving to come to the United States and you know, your first welcome was this uh, astronomical taxi ride that you couldn't share with anyone. And you found yourself, though, with with uh, members of the Presbyterian Church who had brought you on a full scholarship and who you had familiarity with um, from from back in, in Palestine. So we, we, we do want to also get ahead to what is happening now uh, with the second Nakba in Palestine. Um, but share a little bit about you yourself coming as this um, person on scholarship and how did you get to be the first Arab to be the moderator of the Presbyterian Church? Moderator. Yeah, the, okay. the, the second largest uh, nonprofit in, in the United States after the Catholic Church, the Presbyterian Church. Yeah. How okay. did you get to this big position? Okay, I uh, after after South Eastern, it was really South Eastern Bible College, and uh, believe it or not, it belonged to the Assemblies of God. So they are really good Christian Zionists and so forth. But uh, uh, Edgar Lee, the New Testament uh, uh, professor, uh, he, I told him I want to go home. He said, "No, you need to go to the seminary." I said, "Yes." So he gave me three seminaries and I was accepted uh, up in Gordon Divinity in Massachusetts, up in Kentucky at Asbury, and then I was accepted at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And uh, Archer Gleason, the Old Testament professor, said, if you come, we'll give you a full scholarship and you can help me teach Arabic and Hebrew. And will give you more money okay so money is good so you know coming from galilee to florida is a honeymoon but to go uh, to chicago in the winter that was the most miserable experience i uh, i experienced uh you know i had a vw bug and when you drive on snow uh, you don't put a sudden break so i had a, a miserable experience so after the first quarter i called somebody in jacksonville florida i said gabe you always wanted me to go to Columbia uh, Seminary. Uh, I There's no doubt in my mind that God Almighty is calling me to Columbia Seminary. So he got in touch with the president, and uh, the president, uh, the, the dean, sent me the application. I filled the application, and I came. I never forget that ride from Chicago to Decatur. Only gas, restroom, gas, restroom. I just wanted to get out of Chicago. <laughs> so uh, in uh, in the Decatur, then I start uh, to do ministry in the Presbyterian Church. And uh, the last year I did uh, at First Presbyterian. And later I became a youth minister and then a, a mission uh, 
uh, minister in the in the church and uh, uh, and then one uh, after 9/11 one christian educator uh, a woman i knew was praying and she said why not to ask fahed in the presbyterian system says stand for as a candidate for moderator so she called the executive presbyter the executive presbyter just said to her, there's no way in hell he can be, you know, uh, elected. So uh, they start talking in uh, October, November, December. I knew nothing about it. Uh, and then in January, this lady, the chair of the nomination committee calls me and said, we like to nominate for you to go to be a commissioner. Remember, you cannot be a monitor until you're a commissioner to the General Assembly. So I said to her, you know, I've been a commissioner. We are a large presbyter. We need to send others. She said, no, we want you. I did not know what was going on. I said, okay. And then a week later, uh, the executive presbyter calls me and says, uh, I'd like to come to your office at First Presbyterian to meet you. I said, no, Ed, I'll come to you. He said, come, you know, Wednesday at three o'clock. So I, I went to the executive uh, presbyter office in the presbytery of Greater Atlanta. And he said, you accepted to be a commissioner. That's great. We want you to stand as a candidate for moderator. I said, Ed, there's no way. We need to wait 10 years. So he said, 10 years, you will be dead. And 10 years, he will be dead. You know, God moved in a mysterious way. I said to him, I need to pray about it. Talk with my wife and talk with others. Yeah, and and uh, basically, uh, I went and I was elected June 15, uh, uh, 202, as a moderator, the highest position in the Presbyterian Church USA. Wow. And... Um... I'm sure there's no coincidence that you being moderator of the Presbyterian Church USA also helped contribute to the fact that the Presbyterian Church USA was the first national church to divest against companies doing business illegal, illegally in the Palestinian uh, lands, including um, Motorola, Hewlett Packard. And, and, and you know, there, 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 is, uh, there is a reason. There is a reason because uh, I was moving around the chair speaking. And this uh, 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 pastor of a First Presbyterian Church in Gainesville, Florida, he said, Fahid, I have a BA, Master, and an honest to God PhD. And I never, you, you get out of the box. How you, how you are a Christian and a Presbyterian and a moderator, I, I was out of the box. Okay, so. He, yes, um, Reverend Fahid. He uh, saw something in the Christian century or somewhere. Uh, to go as a uh, as a you know to Hebron, he's very smart. So he the uh, de dean of the medical school and asked him to come, and um, he went with him. And for the first time, when they went to Hebron, he said, "Fahid, I'm from the south. I'm from North Carolina, and I know what that means." When I took the child hand to protect them from the settlers, it, my 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 blood was boiling this is wrong but israel occupation is is not right yeah so he did instead you know talking and then basically it is the medical doctor that said to him what can we do about it and he said to him i know what we can do we can take the money of the pension money of the ministers and we direct the board of pension to divest from everything going uh, to Israel. Yes. And that's really what happened. The one that changed the mind of these people will be uh, uh, Hebrew. Well, thank you. Thank you for that history. Um, I, I am aware, Reverend Fahed, that uh, time is running and your, uh, your legacy uh, as a Palestinian and with the Presbyterian Church is uh, extremely important, but I know that many people now want to hear from you uh, about what's happening in in in, in Gaza now, the uh, Nakba 2.0. And let's start that conversation. We have a question in the chat from Janet Gray. 
And she's saying, I'm wondering what it was like for Reverend Abu Akal to be in the United States during the Six Day War, which was so consequential for Palestinians. What perspectives was he able to access? What different conversations was happening about why the war happened and what the outcome would be? And then, of course, here we are today. So if you could tie that together and then so we'll- I need to, to focus my answer and be short. I would say, Uh, somebody invited me uh, from Lakeland, Florida, because uh, to uh, basically go hear a Baptist minister uh, uh, saying that the Arabs and the Jews have been fighting since the time of Abraham. That's after the Six Day War. So I came back to the library and I started to search and search and search. You know, the, from a, a secular history and from a uh, from a biblical history, there is no way. You can prove to me that Arabs and Jews have been fighting since the time of Abraham. But we preachers, anytime we cling to something, even it's a myth, but not in reality, we preach it like, like it's true. So uh, number one, uh, the Arabs and Jews have not been fighting since the time of Abraham. Uh, number two, uh, basically today, uh, the Palestinians are paying the sins of Christian Europe, the one that did not like the Jewish people in Europe will be the Christian Europe. And the, in a good number of times, it is the Arab Muslim who protected the Jews in North Africa and in the Arab world. So I want to diffuse a lot of anti-Arab, anti-Muslim propaganda in the United States uh, that exists. Number two, you know, I, I there, there's, there's no way for us to understand the action of Israel in Gaza today uh, without understanding uh, settler colonialism. Well, and that's the difference. Colonialism, the European countries went to Africa, the Middle East and Asia, they went in, sucked the resources, used the people and went home. Settler colonialism is we, the US, Canada and Australia. Our goal is to kill the natives, take the land, and they take the resources. The U.S., Canada, and Australia succeeded. The problem with Israel, look what happened. The 155,000 Palestinians who became citizens of the state of Israel today, there are 2 million Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel. Gaza is 2.3. That means the moment you hear the word Gaza, you need to say they're coming from 63 uh, towns around Gaza and 75% of Gaza, what? Refugees. And in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, you have 2.8. So for the first time in Israeli history, you, between the river of Jordan to the sea, Israel today controls 14 million people, 7 million Israeli Jews, and 7 million uh, Palestinian Arabs. So the real fight is between Israel and the Palestinian people. It's not Israel and Hamas, number one. Number two, you can't understand uh, four Israeli soldiers run running after a 10-year-old kid. It's abnormal. It's sick. If a, a five American soldiers running uh, after a 10-year-old a kid in Atlanta, it, it, we say they are crazy. That is happening today in the in the West Bank. The same thing, uh, what uh, happened on October 7, I cried and I prayed for the innocent people. But for, uh, the thing that is bugging me, I need to go after white preachers and our American Jewish community. How, how can we justify killing 33,000 people, injuring more than 90,000 people, moving by force a million point seven from the north of Gaza to the middle of Gaza and now toward uh, Rafa? How can we uh, justify destroying the hospitals, destroying the schools, destroying the universities, destroying the churches, 400 mosques destroyed. 
that's not normal. That's not only ethnic cleansing, that's general and that's settler colonialism. Reverend Fahad, having lived through the Naksa, uh, Nakba and then the Naksa of 67, and what we've seen now uh, for the world to see with social media, I mean, it's, everyone in the world knows exactly what's happening. Are you, were you surprised that the, the international community would allow this to proceed to this level? And is there no end in sight? Well, I am surprised, but you, we need to say really two, three things. One, one that really uh, after 55 years in the United States, almost 56, I will say, uh, you know, the Hebrew scripture said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. With all the suffering, with all the pain, with all the injured, with everything is going on, uh, I will say for the first time in 75 years, the Palestine narrative and story is coming to the four corners of the globe. That means people are hearing our narrative, our story, our injustice, and our oppression in a way we never dreamed uh, before. The, the issue right now, will, will American uh, 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 Jewish people who are the leaders in civic rights, human rights, and everything that is progressive uh, really reflect on this. And I like to quote uh, Rabbi Brent Rosen. He said, at this point, we in the American Jewish community, we are going to have a cleavage. One, you are for justice or you are for Zionism. I would like to, you know, to suggest the church need to do the same thing. Uh, are we for justice or for Christian uh, Zionism? And the thing that, you know, hurts me is this, uh, you know, we have, which is good news, we have a thousand black preachers went to the New York Times and say to the president of the United States, uh, a ceasefire now and permanent ceasefire. So in Atlanta, we took four of those preachers and went to the Atlanta Constitution and had 155 uh, uh, preachers uh, signing. The thing that is bugged me is my own presbytery. Uh, the white preachers are not willing to step because they are afraid to hurt the Jewish feeling or the Jewish relationship. I'm not able to understand justice is justice. A child is a child. I don't care if they are Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist. Right now, I want to lay, clink to the reality that we are a human being and we need to solve to be, you know, to solve our problem as a human beings, not as a Christian, Jew, Muslim, and all of that stuff. Uh, uh, I am a person of faith, but all through history, people use religion to oppress others. It's too late in the 21st century. You know, uh, Reverend Fahed, um, and I, I say this as a person of the Muslim faith, um, I know that one thing that um, the Abrahamic faiths have, have in common, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, is um, the concept of uh, a Messiah coming. And um, ironically, we've seen this evoked um, <clears throat> by, uh, of all people now, um, the head of, of uh, KUFI, um, Christians United um, uh, uh, for Israel, uh, John Hagee, and of course that's a white supremacist uh, hate group, um, but yet they're even evoking what happened with um, Israel attacking the um, the uh, consulate, the Iranian consulate in Syria, and then, and then Iran's attack as a sign that uh, Gog and Magog are coming. So uh, whether you are a Palestinian in Gaza and being, if not bombed to death, starved to death, looking for God to save you, as only God can save you from empire at this time, and that you have others evoking um, uh, the Messiah returning for completely different reasons. How do you reconcile that? And are we looking at a time of Armageddon now? 
And that's where uh, I see uh, Reverend I Alex Howard. Uh, uh, I see Reverend Le Alex Howard. Uh, uh, he, uh, right now, by the end of this uh, uh, month, uh, by the first week of May, we're going to have, we are called Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace. Uh, we want to tell American uh, churches, Protestant, uh, Catholic, and Orthodox, we are Palestinian Christians. Will you invite us and hear our stories? The issue you are talking about is called uh, basically uh, uh, Christian Zionism or uh, dispensational theology. In my case, the Presbyterian Church already said way back in 45, 46, dispensational theology is heretic. And the same thing in 1992, uh, uh, the General Assembly said this is not uh, a, a, a reform uh, theology. That theology says uh, that the universe consists of like seven dispensation. The first dispensation is brother Adam and Eve, and then uh, uh, Abraham, and then the prophets, and then the New Testament, and then Jesus, and then the church. And finally, the last dispensation is basically uh, the creation of the state of Israel. That means the creation of the state of Israel uh, says that Jesus' second coming is coming like uh, tomorrow. And, you know, the, the issue of the second coming in the church happened all the way in the first church. I think to me, uh, in Presbyterian theology, we believe in the end time, but we want to believe how can we have faith in Jesus, respect other, and and respect uh, our our community? When he comes, it's in God's hand. The issue with the the dispensational theology with the Southern Baptist mega churches, you know, they put God in their pocket and they tell you when he is coming. Like right now, they are this uh, uh, preacher from Texas is calling uh, Iran God and my God. And sometimes they call Russia. In the past, they called Italy and so forth. So to me, right now, in our Christian, uh, Muslim, and Jewish faith, how are we faithful to God in loving God and loving our neighbor? If if my love to God is not going to force me to love my neighbor, something is wrong with my faith. That's where I am. Yes, thank you. thank you, Reverend Fahad. We're going to open it up uh, for for questions now. Um, uh, short questions, please, because we've only got about fifteen minutes um, left. Uh, and if they could be more in the form of questions rather than than statements. Um, and while people uh, do uh, uh, put their questions uh, in the chat or, or or raise their hand. Um, Reverend Fahad, we have, could you give us some resources that will help inform us about what yes. the history right, is? Right now, I like for people to write down uh, www.christianzionism.org. Christianzionism.org. These are uh, well respected. scholars take you from Genesis to Revelation and convince you that Christian Zionism theology is not biblical and it's it's excellent uh, website. The books I always uh, recommend is basically uh, the first one from Ellen Pappy called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. He tell you what happened 47, 48, 49 when the state of Israel was uh, created. The other book that is excellent for people who love the scripture will be Colin Chapman. Colin Chapman wrote a book called Who's Promised Land? Uh, and that's an excellent, if you are really a biblical scholar, I want to take you from Genesis uh, to Revelation. And he really argue in excellent way. Uh, the other one, uh, I see Alex Awad. He wrote a book about the story of his, uh, when his dad was uh, uh, shot by the Israeli in 48, and how his mother, who is a person of faith, 
uh, really took care of her eight children. She put four in an orphanage and four she took care of them. Her, his story uh, uh, is like the story of Israel, a uh, story of Palestinians. It's an excellent uh, book. Right now, I'd like to recommend the latest book by uh, a leading theologian by the name of Mitri Rahim, who is speaking right now at Harvard in the bookstore. His latest this book called Decolonization, Decolonizing, uh, uh, Decolonizing uh, uh, Palestine, the land, the people, and the Bible. And uh, he is doing an excellent job uh, with that. And there are a lot of uh, uh, resources. I'd like for you to open the, our website, uh, www. PCAP, P like Paul, C like cat, A, uh, and P like Paul, dash us.org. That's Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, dash us.org. Uh, but we're only taking the letter. Thank and you. of course, uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation, Sabil, uh, the Israel Palestine Mission Network. We can send them a lot of resources from this uh, event if you want. Thank you, thank you, Reverend Fahad. And we have um, folks also putting some other good resources in the chat. Um, we've we've got about uh, twelve more minutes, and um, really, uh, with the situation in in Gaza, and of course, um, the genocide uh, accelerating as people starve to death, and miles and miles of convoys convoys of aid are denied in. Um, at the same time, we see in the West Bank uh, and East Jerusalem, we, we see pogroms. We see uh, today more more people um, being uh, displaced from East Jerusalem. So it it looks like it's going to get worse. Before so that means while our eyes are on Gaza, the settlers are doing anything they want in the West Bank villages, killing, burning, and doing everything. So as, as a, a minister, a, a, a Christian minister born in the land of um, Jesus, the prophet Jesus, and um, you used to walk the same places where the prophet Jesus walked, and some of his spirit and his teachings are infused in you, and you are also of the people there, so you have an acute pain we 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 all, particularly on this call, feel feel a, a pain and a, a vicarious trauma watching what's happening. But these are your people, and how how do you cope at at, at this time? And what is what are your recommendations to us as we move forward? Um, as, as I have a I have a a, a professor at Mercer University. University Macon uh, by the name of Hai Khuri, who is uh, who is disabled, and uh, he was born in Nablus, and he wrote a book from Nablus to Macon, Georgia, and the title of that book is "Giving Up Is Not an Option." So I I feel uh, at this point giving up is not an option. Uh, number one, number two, uh, we at this point need to put a lot of energy about us in the United States. How are we going to connect with our two senators and our representative and our president? Unless the politics of the U.S. change toward Palestine, really uh, the, uh, the book of a hundred year war over Palestine for Khalidi, it tells you that there's no difference between Democrat and Republicans, both, you know, uh, Zionists like nobody's business. Uh, and uh, so th the issue is how we, in a small way, can affect change in our church, in our uh, people that we know, uh, how we are going to create a new vision that we have 7 million Israeli Jews, 7 million Palestinian Arabs to live in peace together. The, the 7 million uh, Israeli Jews are not going to go 
uh, to Brazil or the 7 million Palestinians are not going to go to Saudi Arabia. The issue is we need creative ways. How do we, you know, uh, basically do uh, BDS, uh, do something that can change the paradigm of what Israel is doing to the Palestinians? I feel uh, that uh, at this point, I want the Israelis and the Palestinians to make their own decision. But if you ask me, as Fahed, after 55 years living in the States, the only path is for both people to live together in a secular constitution and focus on citizenship and not the Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, and so forth. That's where I am. Thank, thank you, uh, Reverend Fahed. Uh, you know, it, it strikes me as a Christian minister and also as a member of FOR that um, nonviolence is core to your being. Uh, it is. And, and really, let's focus the issue. In Islam, the, the, the idea of justice, it's all over the Quran. When you go to the Hebrew scripture, uh, uh, Micah is so powerful. He said, you know, I, I don't want the rams. I don't want to sacrifice. I don't want you to put, uh, you know, oil in your head, oh human being, until you do justice. Love mercy. Walk humbly. I don't know you. The same thing with Jesus. He said, you know, uh, uh, if you don't clothe the naked, uh, feed the hungry, welcome the stranger, visit uh, the prisoner, I don't know you. So we need to focus, you know, uh, how do we exist as human being loving and respecting one another and that's the issue and i think uh you know i always say to people uh, uh in north georgia we have the cherokee nation the they say to the people in decatur and in atlanta i love jesus they build a church i love education they build a school i love just this you know, they build a courthouse. But when the governor and the powers to be wanted during the gold rush, North Georgia, he said goodbye to your Jesus, goodbye to your church, goodbye to everything. So we need to focus is the issue is not Judaism, Christianity, Islam. The issue is can we work for justice for our human family? That's the bottom line. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um what are your thoughts about the upcoming elections and um, how do we turn the United States, which with all of its flaws, such as the genocide of the indigenous people and the forced uh, slavery of 12 million people from Africa, um, uh, the forced abduction of slavery. I mean, and it, here we are today, a very imperfect country, which is also wreaking havoc, death and destruction all over, all over the world. Um, you know, our, our Congress is divided, yet it is an agreement on uh, being the largest purveyor of, of weapons throughout the world. So how, how do we turn this country around? How do we practice and live uh, as, 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 a, um, as a country where Jews, Muslims, Christians, Hindus, people of no faith, can reclaim our Congress and and thereby stop sending weapons to, to Israel. I mean, what's the well, what's the short list of things to do, Reverend Fahad? First, uh, uh, we need uh, to confess about our past uh, as a settler colonial, what we did to the Native American and what we did to the Black people, and now the same stream is coming up with uh, with Trump and others that uh, this nation belongs only to white people, but in reality, this nation belongs to its uh, uh, citizens. I will say uh, we need to start creating a counterculture because we are our individualistic culture, and uh, we need to start to see how people can care for one another in a new way. In this, I would say my hope, uh, since I already reached 80, I would say my hope is with the young women and men of America. I was invited several weeks ago to go outside the 
Israeli consulate to pray. I thought we'll have 25, 30, and so forth. Lo and behold, we had 300 people, and the majority are young adults. Where they came from, I don't know. Yes, truly, the young generation. But they connect with each other, and almost 30% yeah. uh, of them are Jews. And so, forth. so my hope is with the young people of America, and we, the older people, need to support them. Yes. And we agreed. need to change our policy. We agreed. Um, Reverend Fad, we have a question from Judith Ellis. Uh, Judith, go ahead. You need to unmute. You're muted. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm just wondering if you, you are. Ahead. I'm just wondering if you're familiar with the work of Dr. Mate and his sons and daughter, the entire Mate family. He's one of the trauma psychiatrists and a, a survivor of the Holocaust. And his children are journalists that all talk about being raised Zionist and then coming to the understanding of Palestine and how difficult it is. And they have quite a compassionate hearts for the journey, yeah. you know, to awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say it's very difficult, but let me share with you two, three things. Every time I took a group to Israel, Palestine, I always wanted them to visit Yad Vashem, because when you go inside the, the Holocaust Memorial and go out, you discover you are subhuman in the eyes of a German. Huh? When the evening, when we, we reflect, I would say every time I go through it, it gives me power against the settlement. It gives me power against stealing the land. It gives me power against everything that Israel doing in the occupation to the Palestinian people. If I use the Holocaust to oppress, I'm desecrating the Holocaust. We need to start having a new language. I can't let the Holocaust shut up the truth. The, the Holocaust need to say the truth and the word of, of justice, okay? Yes, that is exactly now, uh, when I went the perspective. Up to Chicago, my room. Yes. Uh, the, when I went to uh, Chicago, the, my roommate wa was a young uh, uh, a Jewish American from Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, late at night we were talking and he was sharing that, you know, his uncle is a lawyer and uh, he told him that, you know, he's going to shift his money from, uh, uh, you know, J Street to to uh, to APAC. And uh, in a way, one time he told him, do not get in touch with me because he's he's talking about, uh, you know, Palestinian justice. So all of us suffer in our own cocoons, but the issue is we really need a shift in the American Jewish community. We need yes. a shift in the Israeli uh, 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 Jewish community if anything is going to go forward. And this last week I hosted a uh, uh, a medical uh, a professor from Harvard University, she is retired. I want everybody to open her website and I hope that uh, Ariel will invite her on the show. Uh, her name is Ellis Rothschild and her website is ellisrothschild.com. I tell you, when she tell you her story, it's the most moving experience. And she did most of the research pre October 7 on the health cases in 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 Gaza and so forth so uh, uh, all of us suffer in our own area but, but I think we need to get our in, in our, outside our own cocoon and say you know the, the killing of 33,000 uh, the injuring of uh, 90,000 and moving by force everything is happening number but we are not doing anything about uh, the feeling, the pain, the suffering of these people, and we need to start t telling stories. I have a professor here that he lost a hundred people of his family. Uh, another Christian family lost several people, and they were bombed in the church, and uh, and so forth. I want us to look at each other as a human being, and when they suffer, I want to uh, stop your suffering, and so forth.
Thank you. Thank you for that question, Judith. Um, we're, we're about to close. Um, I'm going to read uh, something that Meg Finnerty put in the chat, which I think summarizes uh, how many of us feel. And then um, after I read that, Reverend Fahad, could you close us with a prayer? Yeah. I want to say hello to Beverly Brewster. She is from California. California and uh, she visited my village in Galilee and she's a lawyer but you know these lawyer God will work in their hearts and she's a Presbyterian minister now <laughs> she's a good lawyer um so Meg writes thank you Reverend Fahad Abu Akal we need to work for justice regardless of the faiths that people worship this is for both the U.S., Israel, and Palestine. I think that secular society can work if people want to make it work and treat other human beings as equal and deserve to be respected and cared about. So we we nurture and celebrate our shared humanity. And in these darkest of days, we strive to keep our humanity and continue our prayers, ceaseless prayers for the beloved people of Palestine. And Ghazda, if you could please close us with, with your own prayer. Will do. And I want to say hello to Betty Dora. Uh, she is a poet, a teacher, uh, a all the time for everyone. Let us pray. God of justice, God of love, God of mercy, and God of compassion, God of hospitality. We, as human family, come to you asking for your intervention. Today we pray for the Palestinian people in Gaza. We cannot imagine their suffering, their situation. We lost a dad or a mother or a sister or a brother. We pray for the people who suffered from the October 7 attack. And we pray for the hostages, both in Gaza and in Israel. God, we pray for the Israeli rulers and the people in the Knesset to come back to their senses and start to get out of Gaza and help to free the Palestinian people because their desire is freedom, liberty, and loving your neighbor. God, we pray for our president, the administration, the Congress, and the Senate. We pray for ourselves, work through us, that we might share the story we hear today with our friends and other people. Help us to be instrument of reconciliation. Help us to be instrument of peace and help us to be instrument of justice. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you so much, Reverend Fahad, for those beautiful, beautiful words. Um, this this uh, Gathering Voices will be recorded for those of you who want to listen to it later. I've put Reverend Fahad's email in the chat if you wish to be in contact with him. He's very happy to visit your community and to speak in person or by Zoom. And we thank all of you so much for joining us. And we keep praying, praying for the beautiful Palestinian people. And we also encourage you to, um, to um, uh, donate money to UNWA and do everything you can. So thank you so much. Thank you.